morning. I appear on behalf of the Apple and Pacific Pearl Company Limited, the owners yes. of the vessel Panamax Alexander. My learned friend, Sir James Turner, appears on behalf of the respondent. Yes. Well, as before we start, might I just confirm that you have uh, some updates to the bundle? Yes, I'm, well, mine was updated, I think, yesterday afternoon or this morning. M my Lords, I I'm pleased to hear that. There's Just to confirm, there should be some additions to the supplementary bundle, at page 193 and following. Claim form. My, my Lord, yes, there's the... These are claim. There's the pleadings. Yeah. And then your lordships will find at 225 the standard forms for the ASG, ASG2. Yes. Uh, and then right at the back, we've included a, a copy of the uh, the undertaking, as, as actually we noticed it hadn't been in the bundle, but the undertaking, which is the subject of this yes. hearing, is at the back. Yeah. Lord, yes, we've got those. Thank you. Um, I can tell you that we've obviously read the skeleton arguments and the judge's judgment. My Lord, I, I'm much obliged, and your Lordships uh, will therefore be aware it rises out of the collision of the two vessels, the Ossos Dave and the Panamax Alexander, in the Suez Canal in uh, July 2018. Following that collision, the parties entered into a collision jurisdiction agreement, or CJA, in the standard and widely used form of the London Admiralty Solicitors Group, and the form widely referred to as ASG2. Uh, the wording of that, my lords, which we'll come to in a little bit more detail in due course, of course, provide by clause C that each party will provide security in respect of the other's claim in a form reasonably satisfactory to the other. My lords, the applicant duly offered security in the form of a letter of undertaking from its own club, the Britannia Club, which the respondent and its club, the Standard Club, rejected. And that led, uh, as your lordships will know, to a, a, a prolonged and expensive set of proceedings in South Africa in relation to a vessel called the Panamax Christina, which was said to be an associate vessel of the Panamax Alexander. And those proceedings continue today. They're still going on, are they? They are, my lord, yes. Yeah. I think you tell us there's a hearing in June. June, Do my lord. Do you know, A, the date, and B, what that hearing is about? My lord, the precise, excuse me. Well, it was the 10th of June, we're to I'm told, uh, and uh, amongst the issues is whether there was a genuine need for security, as I understand it. Um, I, I, have, I myself haven't seen the papers in the South African proceedings, so I can't tell your lordships precisely the issues in, in dispute at the moment. But if Panamax was... Christina was arrested while these discussions were going on. Oh, right? Lord, yes, that's correct. Uh, I, I, if I may, I'll, I'll come to outline the, the facts briefly so you, your lordships understand the chronology, but that is right. Yeah. That's before the uh, LOU was offered. I, mean, I just want to ask because I was wondering to what extent um, the court in South Africa and we here may be deciding substantially the same issue. Um, it sounds like there is at least an overlap. My Lord, I, I, I will certainly take instructions, if I may, possibly at lunchtime. Uh, I'm not aware that there's, a, that there's a potential issue of irreconcilable judgments, but we'll certainly... Uh, confirm whether that is or is not the case, your Lordship's fully aware of the position. Well, if they say in South Africa that either there was or there wasn't a genuine need for security, does that affect what we have to decide? Well, my Lord, uh, I, I will, I will also take, take instructions, and that's not my understanding, so I may have not phrased the particular issues uh, very clearly or well, so if I might come back to your Lordship's on that, that would right, be the best way. So, so my Lords, um, by this action, uh, the Applicant, we know, sued the respondent for damages for breach of the CJJA, and following a two-day trial in front of Nigel Tier, sitting then as a, a judge of the High Court, um, his lordship made two key findings relevant to, to this particular hearing. First, that the LOU in question was in a form reasonably satisfactory to the respondent, but the respondent had no obligation to accept that security, notwithstanding it was in a form that reasonably satisfactory to it. As a consequence, my lords, he found there was no breach of contract on the part of the respondent and no claim for damages. And as a result, he dismissed the appellant's claim. Uh, and that's recorded, my lords, in the order in tab 9 of the core bundle at page 173. Lordship, have those in mind. It's paragraph 1 
of that order, order on judgment, for the reasons set out in the judgment handed down on the 21st of October, the claim is dismissed. And just for the sake of completeness, my lords, on in the next tab, page 174, the judge made a related <coughs> costs order. There'd be no order as to the cost of the action. Uh, that effectively reflected the fact that the trial had been predominantly taken up with the first issue, i.e. the so score draw, the judge thought. Uh, my lord, yes, and, and also because the issue of construction had only really arisen during the trial. So uh, just to your lordship to understand the background to that. Now, my lord, my lord, it's uh, uh, by our appeal that we seek to overturn paragraphs one of both of those orders, obviously the dismissal of the claim and, and also the costs uh, order. And we do so, my lord, because we submit the judge was wrong to find there was no breach by the respondent. And in that context, we submit having found that the form of security offered was reasonably satisfactory, he should have found the respondent's rejection <coughs> of that security was a breach of the CJA sounding in damages. Now, my lords, if you well, are... Although you frame it as a duty to accept reasonable security, uh, I mean, the real issue is whether once reasonable security has been provided, you would say offered, it is a breach to um, arrest or maintain an arrest. <coughs> my, my lord, effectively, that, that, that's how we put our... <laughs> the matter arose quite late in the hearing, and I didn't put it in the way I now do in our grounds of appeal. But in our submission, the issue of acceptance, the primary position is the issue of acceptance, actually isn't relevant. If the security is offered up in an acceptable form, that is compliance by us of our contractual obligations, and there's no need or question of acceptance. And then any steps taken by uh, the respondents thereafter are in breach of, 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 of the contract. It's the seeking of additional security, which is the, which is the breach. Or the rather, rather than your offer and acceptance. M my Lord, yes, and the continuation of the proceedings in, in South Africa in that context. Okay. I, mean, I, I think the way you put it in our plea, <coughs> Lord, is that the refusal to, to accept that was a breach and the damages were the consequential costs in South Africa. But, my Lord, on a proper analysis, we do submit your Lordship's right. Um, so that would mean that acceptance is a contractual obligation. It's not simply a question of providing the security. It's got to be accepted. But that's not the way you argue the construction point. Is it? My Lord, it isn't. No, it's, 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 the, it's the second way we argue the construction point. Uh, a primary case on this appeal is that uh, acceptance actually isn't relevant. There's an obligation on us to provide security, on each party to provide security. Well, that's what I'm trying to understand. If, if the only obligation is you provide security and you provide it, what is the breach by the offeree of the security? Well, my Lord, the, 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 is the continuation of attempts to obtain security, other security, by a different... So, as my Lord said, it's the maintenance of the arrest. My Lord, yes. And the maintenance of the arrest is a breach of the CJA rather than the LA. My Lord, yes, we submit that's the case, yes. My Lord, if I, if I might just then um, show your Lordship the order that we seek, if you're otherwise with us, in substitution of the uh, orders at tab 9 and 10. That is uh, found in our appellant's notice at page 7, tab 1 of the core bundle. My Lord, we set out there the order which we uh, seek to be substituted for the judges, and uh, as I understand it, if you're otherwise with us, that's not uh, controversial in its uh, terms. So, well, that's our side of the uh, appeal. As your lordships will be aware, my learned friend has served a respondent's notice. Uh, the nub of which is at page 35 of the, the core bundle, uh, and he essentially seeks to do two things. Firstly, to add further reasons for why the judge was uh, correct not to imply a term uh, that require, sorry, that security be accepted, and that's paragraph one of his respondent's notice. 
Uh, and in any event, he seeks to uphold the orders I've just shown your lordships by challenging the judge's finding that the security in question was in a form reasonably satisfactory to the respondents. And that's uh, paragraphs two and three of his notice. But we'll come back to the detail of that in, in due course. But just to alert your lordships, there is a, a contingent issue raised both in the grounds of appeal and also in paragraph four of my learned friend's respondent's notice. Uh, relating to the renewal of the offer made by my clients at a later date, which was backed by a guarantee from, or uh, well, the offer of a guarantee from HSBC. And my laws, that issue only arises if you find that we're correct that in principle um, there was an obligation to accept satisfactory security, or indeed my primary case that um, provision of security was in itself enough, uh, and you find that the respondent is correct that the LOU was not reasonably satisfactory. So uh, this issue only arises if both of those matters are decided, first in my favour, my learned friend's favour. Uh, and, and if we get to that stage, your lordships will have to consider whether the combination of the LOU uh, and the terms of the guarantee offered by HSBC uh, would have constituted reasonably satisfactory security. Obviously, it came later in the piece, so the, 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 the um, amount of damages that would be uh, owing in that case is, is less, and we're seeking to agree the figures for your lordship. My lord, those, those, uh, that's the shape of, of the appeal. My lord, uh, my lord, the relevant background, of course, set out in some detail in the judgment. Now, my lord, I, I was going to briefly summarise the, the key elements and show you a handful of key documents uh, as a sort of precursor to my submissions. Uh, and my lords, uh, I can take it relatively briefly, I hope, as, ex as explained, the collision was on the 15th of July 2018 between the vessel Panamax Alexander, Osios David, and a third vessel called the Sakizaya Kalon. Not relevant to today's dispute, but it was a three ship collision. My Lord, the parties were all entered with PI clubs who were members of what's called the International Group of PI clubs. And your Lordships will have seen the judge noted in his judgment of paragraph 30 that. Uh, that group comprises 13 largest PI clubs, which cover more than 90% of the world's shipping tonnage. Now, those clubs were in contact with each other almost immediately in this case, as, as usual, to discuss jurisdiction and security. Uh, and um, uh, in that context, as the judge reflected in his judgment, uh, liability for the collision was settled only some time later. And during the course of the discussions, the parties proceeded on the usual basis that liability would be in dispute. And well, after various exchanges on the 8th of August 2018, the applicant and the respondent, in consultation with their respective clubs, agreed in principle to a bipartite CJJ on the standard form of the ASG2 form. Uh, my lords, uh, as the judge explained, the ASG is the Admiralty Solicitors Group I've already referred to, and it comprises solicitors in London practicing in Admiralty law, and they've devised several standard forms for use in such circumstances. Now, my Lord, the CJA itself is in the core bundle at tab 7, page 126. As my lords will see, clause A provides. Right, what was the page? 126. Thank you. Show your lordships the, the document. Uh, clause A provides that the party's claims will be determined exclusively by the English courts in accordance with English law and practice. So, a jurisdiction, law and jurisdiction clause. Clause B is, uh, provides for the acceptance of service of the other party's proceedings. Clause C, of course, which is key to this case, each party will provide security in respect of those claims in a form reasonably satisfactory to the other. D and E are warranties by each party to ownership and the absence of demise charters. And finally, there is a law and jurisdiction clause governing the CJA itself. So we'll have a package of, of uh, uh, provisions covering law, jurisdiction and security. And whilst it may or may not be relevant this appeal to note that as the judge observed at paragraph 21 of his judgment, 
one optional paragraph of the standard form of ASG2 was uh, omitted. And well, we've included that, so you have the references required in the supplementary bundle. It's page 227. Just to show your Lordships where that optional sentence uh, sits, it's, it's in clause C, or C, it's in square brackets. Each party agrees to waive its rights to apply to arrest or rearrest to obtain further security under the civil procedure rule. So that was deleted in this case. I, mean, I was pausing there as the judge observed in his judgment at paragraph four, uh, and I don't think it's in dispute, the purpose, or at least one of the key purposes behind these forms, is to enable parties to uh, agree without delay so that the costs and delays of arrests can be avoided. Now, while well, in this case, exchanges uh, followed the agreement of the CJA as to the amount and terms of the respective security, and uh, as my Lord observed, on the 5th of September, uh, Panama's Christina was arrested uh, in South Africa by the respondent. The Following an earlier draft, it was on the 7th of September that the Appellants PI Club proposed a draft LOI to be provided to the respondents, again based on the standard ASG1 form, uh, which is uh, commonly used in association with the ASG2 form. That had amendments including a so called sanctions clause to reflect an Iranian nexus and a potential risk of sanctions issues uh, arising. Now, again, my lords, the wording is referred to in, in the judgment, paragraph 32, but we've included the, the document itself, so your lordships have it. It's the supplementary bundle, uh, page 232. And your lordships will see there, uh, it's a marked up draft, as I said, there had been an earlier proposal and then uh, a, a further draft provided. For your Lordship's note, the covering email has also been included at page 230, although I'm not sure anything uh, turns on that in this appeal. So my Lords, as we know, the, the wedding was rejected uh, by the Respondents PI Club, and indeed from that time on, the respondent and its uh, club refused to accept any LOU that contained any form of sanctions clause. <coughs> and your lordships will see that reflected in the judgment at paragraphs 34 and in particular paragraph 52. And that indeed is the background uh, against which the dispute came before the court, more of which uh, later. Given So the, off the offer, the security offered was for payment in euros. Well, that sounds right. Yeah, that's what, what it says on yeah. 232. Yeah. Well, yes. Presum presumably to avoid going through the US. Well, amongst other things, yes. That was one of the, one of, one of the issues that uh, I, I think was they sought to address by that, yes. Malos, given um, my learned friend's respondent's notice and the points he makes therein and the judges, how the judge dealt with them, I think it is relevant to see uh, the response to that. Uh, my Lord, it's, it's the, the document itself I don't think is in the bundles, but it is reflected in his Lordship's uh, judgment, paragraph 34. Having received uh, the draft I've just shown your Lordship's on the 7th of September, the response uh, from the Standard Club is found and summarised in paragraph 30, set out in paragraph 34 of the Lordship's Judgment on page 180 of the uh, bundle. If I might just ask your Lordships to read that to themselves.
Is the grammar in numbered paragraph two correct? Is the word not misplaced? Cannot be made certain this voyage will not ultimately become a sanctioned voyage. Do they mean it's not certain that it will become a sanctioned voyage? Well, Lord, I think that's probably right. <laughs> or, or maybe not. No, I don't think it does. I think it means it, it, there is a real chance that it will be a sanctions problem, I think. Well, can, can I ask and, and, and therefore that they won't get paid. I think that's what they're saying. Oh, I see. Is there something wrong with the paragraph king in the circumstances? Second line, should it be bad deeds of your member? Yes. My lord, yes. But maybe that's judgment. Is that a judgment typo or an original error? Do we I think know? it may be a judgment it, it typo. It almost certainly doesn't matter if my, my lord, everybody's agreed. We, we, we are all agreed, and there's certainly no suggestion to the contrary below. Um, my lord, the relevant point, is, as, as the judge summarised at paragraph 52, is that the standard was making clear by that message that uh, it and its uh, member were insisting on receiving an LOU without any sanctions clause. And indeed, that's the stance they maintained uh, thereafter, notwithstanding, as your Lordship will be aware, the wording proposed was in fact approved by the uh, sanctions committee of the International Group of P&I Clubs, again recorded in the judgment of paragraph 36. But th there isn't any standard sanctions clause, either by the Admiralty Sisters Group or by the International Group. So no, ad, ad hoc. They'll have a look at the clauses that are proposed. Is that how it works? Well, Lord, there's no standard wording uh, agreed or, or, or proposed by either of those. That's correct, my Lord. As we'll see, my Lord, that, that there is evidence, was evidence in this case, of the use of exactly our wording by other clubs. But we'll maybe come to that in due course. My Lord, it's uh, the hour your discussion time has opened. Thank you. Both of us obviously missed it, my Lord. So, uh, in any event, my Lord, the the um, that was the initial exchange. Things uh, then uh, went um, relatively slowly, and there was a further exchange a month or so, so later, which again is relevant to my learned friend's uh, respondent's notice, uh, and that's recorded in paragraph forty-one of the judgment. Your chips will see the judge then records a discussion on the second of October between Mr. Robson of Britannia, that's our club and Miss Dumini of Standard Club. Uh, and uh, your Lordships will see the issue was uh, rather belatedly raised, the use of the term reasonable endeavours, and that was, that was discussed during that conversation. So I'll just draw your Lordships' attention to the last line, where Mr. Robertson appears checked internally that day and been informed that the wording could be changed to best endeavours. And indeed, for your Lordship's note, that's reflected in an internal email you'll find in the core bundle at page 149. This is um, a, an email of the same day from Mr. Robertson to Cypress Sea Lines, who are managers of the vessel. And your Lordship will see he's recording the conversation with Miss Dumini. And the part I would draw your Lordship's specific attention to is, is the sixth paragraph. AD, it's Miss Dumini asked whether we would be prepared to replace with reasonable endeavours with best endeavours. I said I would check internally, I have, and we would be prepared to. So just your Lordship to have that reference, it, it's relevant when we come to consider the respondent. But that doesn't seem to have been communicated, does it? My, my, it, it wasn't because uh, two days later uh, the respondent's club came back and repeated their stance that they wouldn't accept an LE with any form of sanctions clause, so it was not obviously relevant to discuss what that clause might say. Um, so my Lord, that is uh, again um, reflected in the judge's judgment at paragraph 42 on the 4th of October, Ms. Doomley referred to a telephone call and advised Mr. Robinson that her members did not agree to replace the UK LOU with the Britannia LOU. She explained her members are not obliged to accept security, which may or may not be effective, and that's a reference to the, uh, to the sanctions clause. And we're also pausing there, as we say in our skeleton, at least until trial. The major, if not the only issue, was whether the respondents 
were entitled to refuse an LOU containing any form of sanctions clause uh, on the basis it didn't constitute reasonably satisfactory security. But in any event, my lords, uh, as a result of the refusal to accept that wording, or accept a, a sanctions clause, the parties reached a stalemate, the proceedings in South Africa continued, and in a, an attempt to break the logjam, some months later on the 6th of May, uh, the Appellants p &I Club offered an LOU in the same terms as we've seen, but this time backed by a guarantee from HSBC. Well, this obviously goes to the contingent issue that I've identified to your Lordships. And so your Lordships have the reference, the terms of the proposed guarantee are at page 151 of the core bundle. And my Lords, we, we um, this is a clear, irrevocable, unconditional guarantee at uh, seven or eight lines down. It reads, we irrevocably and unconditionally guarantee to pay to your order within seven banking days of a valid demand in writing to be made by letter received by us via courier, such sums as may be due to you from the owners of the Panamax Alexander in respect of the said collision, either by written agreement the parties or unappealable judgment of the English court. Limit on uh, the amount, and then over the page, provide always you have first made a valid written demand for payment under the letter of undertaking, dated blah, 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 issued by Britannia Steamship, and the Britannia Club has not paid you within 14 days of such valid demand. <coughs> and if I just ask your Lordship, in fairness, my little friend, to read the, the, the rest of it, because he takes issue with the adequacy of this wording uh, in terms of providing uh, satisfactory security. So, my lords, that, that offer was open for... Yeah, this doesn't contain a sanctions clause, though, this yeah. guarantee. Correct, my lords, correct. And that's why we say that even if you find, contrary to our primary position, that the LOU offered itself was not reasonably satisfactory, mm. this, if you like, cures any such defect, yeah. cured any such defect. It's just puzzled why the Britannia thought it necessary to include the sanctions clause, but HSBC didn't. <laughs> well, my lord... Uh, it's there for what it is, my lord. Uh, we didn't investigate that in in the evidence because issues weren't raised in that context. I know my little friend says there's no evidence the HFC would have provided this, and it's a matter we may have to I may, might have to address your lordship on. But they, we submit plainly were prepared to offer it, um, and it's there for what it's worth. Um, so, my lord, we didn't investigate as I said because the issues I don't think. Yeah. It covered that, that issue. Well, the, the, the other point, close to it, didn't they? Because the uh, rationale for the club wanting a sanctions clause was the super sensitivity of the banks in um, not making payments relating to Iran. But here's HSBC, apparently not bothered. Well, my, my lord, uh, I, I think without wishing to um, delve into the evidence, I think I think it was to the fact that some banks may be more sensitive than others in the usual way, and one may not be able to predict. One of the issues is whether one can predict whether a particular bank in the chain might have a problem with it. Uh, and that was canvassed, I think, by the, by, by the, with the experts. Um, uh, and the, I think the evidence was that some banks may be unwilling to provide or, or make a payment, even if there is actually no breach of sanctions. This is the, some banks may, some may, may be less sensitive. <coughs> My Lord, that, that uh, just just sorry. going back in the chronology, the Christina was released on a UK club LOU Correct. very soon after the <coughs> refusal by the standard to accept your proposed wording. So correct, that's correct, my Lord. And we, we, there's an agreement whereby we pay for the maintenance of that uh, guarantee by the UK <coughs> club, and that's part of the damages which we claim, which the judge did consider. Well, just on the HSBC guarantee, the other point I uh, ask your Lordships to notice is that it was uh, held open for seven days, a period which the respondents say was too short. Uh, it, in reality, no extension was, however, sought. Uh, the uh, alternative offer was not accepted within seven days or indeed at all. And a couple of months after uh, that was offered, these proceedings were started, I think, in July of that year. Well, that's a brief overview of the factual background, the bare bones, I think, that are relevant to, to this appeal. 
And my Lords, in terms of the submission subject to the court indicating otherwise, my intention was to focus first on our appeal in my oral submission and then in reply to deal with my learned friend's respondent's notice and the HSBC issue uh, to the extent necessary. So my Lords, that's what I uh, intend to do unless your Lordships wish me to adopt a different course. Fine. My Lord, in relation to our appeal, as I've indicated, uh, it arises out of the judge's finding that notwithstanding uh, the fact the LOU was in a form he judged to be reasonably satisfactory, the respondent's rejection was not a breach of contract. In, in reaching that view, he accepted the argument that there was no duty on the respondent to accept uh, any form of LOU at, at all. Now, my Lord, just as a, a footnote, I've set out in my skeleton, uh, paragraphs 31 to 36, how the issue arose rather late in the day. Um, I don't need to go back to that here. As I've indicated, it's really to illustrate the point uh, or why the point was not as fully developed before the judge as it might otherwise have been. It, go it goes no further than that. We make no criticism, my learned friend, or indeed the judge in that context. It is, it is what it is. But it uh, explains why the matter was perhaps not dealt with as fully uh, as might otherwise have been the case. My Lord, as to the submissions we advance on this appeal, we submit the judge was wrong, both as a matter of construction, uh, and uh, if we're wrong on that, uh, on the issue of whether a relevant term should be implied into uh, the contract. Uh, and as I think we've already identified, we essentially put the matter in three ways, which are reflected in our grounds of appeal at uh, tab one page 14. I'm sure your Lordships have those well in mind, but we say, first of all, in the true construction of the agreement contained in the CJA, it was sufficient to fulfil uh, the appellant's obligations under Clause C to provide security in a form reasonably acceptable, and the respondent was bound by the terms of that security. In other words, the issue of acceptance is, we submit, not relevant. No acceptance is required. Alternatively, we submit that on the true construction of Clause C, there was an obligation on the party offered the security that was reasonably satisfactory to accept that security. And we put that as a matter of that construction. Alternatively, if your lordships are not with us on either of those first two, there was a term to be implied into the CJA that the party offered security uh, would accept that security. Uh, and to preempt uh, one of the points my learned friend made in his respondent's notice, to do so within a reasonable time. Now, my Lord, relevant to each of the ways in which we uh, put our case, whether it's a matter of construction or implied terms, uh, are the consequences of the judge's finding. Uh, as uh, I've already uh, submitted to your lordships, and as the judge explained in paragraph four of his judgment, uh, these forms are used for, for good reason. The purpose is to, is to enable parties to agree them without delay and thereby avoid the costs, uncertainty and delays caused by uh, an arrest. Those costs, uncertainties and the risks inherent in them are, are potentially very significant as illustrated by the facts of this case. Uh, and that's not just in the context of what actually happened in, uh, in South Africa with the uh, Christina but also the alternative scenario that we explain in paragraph 40 of our skeleton argument. The vessel Panamax Alexander was in fact in Egypt for a considerable period of time for many months. And of course that would have been uh, an obvious place where she might have been arrested by uh, the respondent. Uh, what was common ground between the experts was that proceedings in Egypt are notoriously slow and in fact can realistically take up to 20 years. But how far can you take that particular point? Thinking of what the judge says in paragraph 4 of his judgment, where he says that ASG 2, that's the collision jurisdiction agreement, which is flexible, but ASG 1 is meant to be used without adaptation, and the argument here all arises because you adapted it. Well, my lord... The, the, uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm, I'm with your lord, follow your lordship's point. Well, you say it's all about speed and avoiding an arrest oh, yes. and so on. 
and I can see that if you stick, stick with ASGs 1 and 2 in their form as drafted by the Admiralty Solicitors Group, you can see that. But here the dispute arose because you wanted a bespoke amendment to, to it. Now I'm not saying that that un completely undermines the purpose, but I'm just asking how far can you push it? Well, Mondo, I, I, I think the point stands because the, the expectation is that there, that there may be some negotiation on the precise wording. Indeed, the, we, we would submit the very wording of the collision jurisdiction agreement. If it was invariably intended that the ASG 1 was used, surely that would have said so. But the wording itself, in, in a form reasonably satisfactory, the respondent implies that there may be one or more form of, of, of security that is reasonably satisfactory and it's an objective test. So we do submit that the point remains a good one. Um, otherwise, they simply said that standard form would have said in the form ASG 1. Well, I, I was really just at this point, I was just illustrating the, real, the very real risks and difficulties of, of, of arrests, the potential difficulties that they can cause. And as I said, in Egypt, the, 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 the evidence uh, was that proceedings can take 20 years. Uh, the judge didn't need to resolve it, but there was certainly an issue as to whether the court in Egypt even, even has a power um, to order the sale of a vessel before judgment is given. So uh, that is an issue which simply indicates how serious the consequences could be if the parties don't agree to provisions that avoid uh, uh, this sort of arrest. Um, and the point really is that this is a form which benefits both parties. Both, both the arresting party who avoids being stuck with a bad jurisdiction or who faces the risk of priority claims, as well as the defendant who um, gets their vessel, uh, keeps their vessel free from arrest by the club putting up security. So it's not just a one way agreement. Is that, well, is that where this goes? Well, my lord, that, that, is, that is absolutely right. But, I mean, I think the point I was simply illustrating was, was a rather straightforward one of the, of the real risks and why parties actually uh, agree to these sorts of clauses. But your Lordship is absolutely right, as we see here, you know, with, with the South African proceedings, even the arresting party faces its own difficulties and risks in, in, in arresting. Arrests can be challenged um, and costs, etc., can be incurred. So your Lordship's point is one I would certainly accept. It's a two-way two -way street, and that's why we submit this as a package of law and jurisdiction and security. Um, but my lord, as I said, that, that was really the, the, the Egyptian example was was really to illustrate the potentially grave consequence of not avoiding arrest, um, uh, which is what these provisions are designed to uh, avoid. Uh, and we do submit that when one um, considers the position uh, of an arrest, there's there's a further strong imperative to avoid it because in most jurisdictions, certainly in the UK, uh, a wrongful arrest is something that's very difficult to establish. Uh, as my lord will know, in particular, you, you have to show malice or crassneglentia, uh, uh, and uh, it's a test that's very difficult to fulfil, rarely, if ever, done successfully. Uh, and the consequence for that is for, for, for the ship owner that even if his vessel is arrested uh, uh, in respect of a claim which is subsequently shown to be uh, unsound, he will pick up the consequences in terms of costs and so forth of, of an arrest. There will be no recourse for those costs, um, uh, even if he otherwise wins the case. So it, it's really to emphasise to your lordships the importance of uh, avoiding uh, arrest, uh, and all of which, in my respectful submission, would also be very much in the minds of ship owners and their clubs uh, when they are agreeing the terms of uh, a CJA of the sort that we see. Uh, and my well, lords, the straightforward point is that despite this clear imperative, the very good reasons to avoid uh, arrests, the consequence of the judge's decision is that even after agreeing uh, a CJA, either party is at liberty to refuse reasonably satisfactory security for whatever reason, or indeed for no reason. They can just say no, and they can seek to do just that which the CJA is designed to avoid arrest in a foreign jurisdiction with all the consequences that come from it. Um, and that uh, is, uh, as you say, a uh, 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 consequence of the judge's um, uh, reasoning and his conclusion, uh, and the potential consequences in terms of cost and delay are, we submit, 
uh, all too obvious. Uh, and we do submit that it severely undermines, if not defeats, uh, uh, the very or certainly a key purpose of the CJA itself. And that's a point, as I said, which underlines, runs through all of our submissions on, on the construction implied terms. And indeed, uh, all of those points in, in our submission really serve to reinforce my, my Lord's initial impression when uh, looking at this, that the judge's conclusion was uh, a surprising one. And we submit that uh, on analysis and after careful reflection, it remains no less surprising a decision. Well, with, with that... Uh, introductory remark, if I may, then looking at the issue of construction, it's worth perhaps starting with uh, how the judge uh, addressed this question. It's paragraph 82 of his judgment on page 191 of the bundle, tab 11. And he effectively uh, dealt with it in one sentence, uh, he dealt with the argument of construction uh, and simply said, however, there are no words in clause C capable of bearing the suggested construction. That's the last sentence of paragraph 82. And that's an approach which my learned friend uh, also adopts in his skeleton argument, page 53, it's paragraph 26, 3C. My learned friend says the words used by the parties are not merely incomplete but silent as the existence of such a reciprocal obligation. There is, in short, nothing for the court to construe. Um, well, that is an approach and certainly a, a conclusion that we submit is, is wrong. Um, we submit that applying the proper approach to construction, the words used by the parties, particularly when viewed in context, are capable of and indeed do bear the meaning for which we contend. Now, well, the proper approach to construction uh, we submit is that set out in paragraph 45 of our skeleton argument. Now, my, Lord's, my learned friend uh, and I had, had, had a debate as to how far it's appropriate to refer a, a living judge to his own works, but I, I fear in this well, appeal... As long as you're referring to quotations from cases, there's nothing wrong with it, refer to my particular opinions, there might be. My Lord. My Lord. Um, in any event, without referring to your Lordship's book, I think this, this appeal would be quite difficult to, to pursue. But uh, my Lord, uh, joking apart, we do submit that uh, the proper approach is that uh, taken from your Lordship's uh, book, and indeed, I think, in turn, taken from Lord Newberger's decision in Marley and Rawling, which we set out at paragraph 45. Uh, and your Lordship, I'm sure, will have seen that passage on many uh, occasions, so I don't uh, intend to read it out loud to your lordships. And likewise, my lord, the extract from uh, Lord Justice Lewis's book and Marley are in, in the bundle, but I, I doubt it will assist your lordships to take you to those passages unless you wish me to do so. Well, well that is, as we say, um, uh, the proper approach. We'll come to this application shortly. But well, we do also refer in our skeleton argument to the recent decision in Devani and Wells uh, as an example of a case which demonstrates what we submit is a rather too narrow approach adopted by the judge uh, and the respondent. Now, well, as I'm sure, again, you're familiar with that. The facts were very different. Um, uh, and we uh, simply rely on it for the proposition that we've identified in paragraph 47 of our skeleton, which in turn is taken from Lord Briggs's judgment at paragraph 59, where he made the point that interpretation of contracts is not exclusively concerned with the words used expressly by the parties, and there are occasions where the context of the conduct tells you as much or even more about the essential terms of the bargain than do the words themselves, and doubtless there are cases in between. Now, again, I, I'm conscious that I'm in the Court of Appeal and you're my Lord was also involved in that case. So again, uh, I, I'm not sure I need to take your Lordships to it uh, to, to illustrate the point. It's, it's one that I think is self-evident from, from that quotation. I think if I may say so, Lord Hoffman's example of the supermarket checkout is rather better. My Lord. The, um, the amount of money that's being asked for the broom is so small that you might think that the chap with the broom was offering to sweep the drive. 
My lord, indeed. Uh, indeed. Uh, but my lord, the, the point here is that we, we submit that is, that's what one has to have in mind when one construes uh, the CJA and its terms. Uh, and if one looks at, at that document through the wider lens, the answer as a matter of construction is, is, is the one for which we contend. Now, the first way we put it, my lords, is, is, is as follows. Clear that the CJA is designed to be used in conjunction with a form of LOU, such that there was plainly a common intention not just to agree that law and jurisdiction, but also for security to be provided in lieu of arrest. And if we then look at the provisions of the CJA, clause C, it reads, each party will provide security in respect to the other's claim in a form reasonably satisfactory to the other. And what we submit is plain from those words is that, as I've already indicated, the provision of reasonably satisfactory security is simply the fulfilment of the wider bargain contained in the CJA. That wider bargain is we agree on law and jurisdiction, also on the provision of reasonably satisfactory security. And in our submission, no, no more is required. And that's why, as, as reflected in our grounds of appeal 2A, we submit certainly as our primary case that the recipient is bound by the terms and no acceptance is actually required. So the issue of acceptance we would submit on that analysis is actually a, a red herring. Um, my Lords, if, if that's right, then um, it, it is a, a short answer to, to the appeal. The fact uh, that as a matter of courtesy, the Britannia Club first provided a draft wording of the LAU and invited confirmation shouldn't in our submission detract from that analysis. There's no suggestion, for instance, that uh, but for the respondent's refusal to accept any form of LOU with sanctions clause, that would not have been issued in due course. Uh, and indeed, um, if one considers the position in the hypothetical, if a signed LAU had been sent over and had the applicant, for instance, sought a form of injunction to injunct the foreign proceedings, uh, it's hard to see that the argument, oh, well, that wording was not accepted by us, would actually form any defence to that application. So you, really, I think what you're saying is this was an anticipatory my, my because Lord, it's, of, it's because of, re, of a refusal to accept what was being proffered. My Lord, yes. So renunciation. Uh, my only hesitation with the anticipatory breach is that query whether the time for performance had already arisen or that there's no specific time for offering or providing the security. But exactly that. that they're saying we will, we're not going to perform. We're not going to accept your LOU. On this last, that's a breach. We have provided, we will provide an LAU in a satisfactory form, as the judge has found, and the response say, no, I'm not accepting it. That, in our submission, is, is a renunciatory breach in that part of the contract, at least. I, th um, I thought your primary analysis, um, or your analysis on your primary case, was that the, um, the breach was the maintenance of the arrest in South Africa. And that it is no answer to the respondents to say, well, you didn't actually provide the security, you only offered it, um, because you rely on what you described as the futility principle. Well, that, 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 that's a response to my little friend's point, which is that we, we only. That's, the, uh, that's, the res that's, your, that's your response to his point that, well, you didn't actually provide it. M my lord, uh, uh, sorry, I was just. Confirming, my lord, our, our plea because wrongly in breach of clause, the defendant had rejected the Britannia LOU. Is actually how we pleaded the breach was the rejection of the LOU per se. So if I uh, misled your lordship earlier in terms of how it was pleaded, that's that was the position we uh, adopted in the pleading. Can, can I just ask how this happens as a matter of practice? The LOU is provided. Sorry, I'll avoid using the word provide. <laughs> The LOU is sent in what? Signed form? Just here's a signed LOU without anything else. 
or is it conventionally sent in draft form? In other words, here's a draft, it's in standard form. Well, my, Have a look at it. If you don't raise an objection, we'll provide it. I mean, isn't there a, just at what point do you say you quote provide? And can you unilaterally, in a sense, push a signed LOU onto the recipient? Well, well there, there, it's certainly a common practice for, as a matter of courtesy between clubs, to provide drafts uh, and then to agree them. Uh, there's no evidence that that is a universal practice of any sort. My little friend mentions this in his skeleton, but there was no um, evidence, there is no evidence that that is always the case. And it, it may well be that in cases where uh, different circumstances demand a signed LAU is provided as, as a first port of call. But I would accept that certainly between the clubs it is very common, as a matter of courtesy, professional courtesy, provide drafts for. For, for acceptance in those terms. Um, so that, that is certainly the experience. So does the word provide in your um, submission cover both situations? In other words, it's a description of the process, where, whatever the process is, either a discourteous sending of a signed document without more, which needs no acceptance, but that is provision, or a process by which a draft is sent, a period of time is given, and then it's provided in, in agreed form. Or, or, I'm just trying to understand, because the word provide, I think, is what you place weight on. You say that's the word the judge failed to spot, but it's there which carries the, the weight of your argument. So what does it actually mean? Does it mean literally only when you finally send the final version, or does it mean a process leading up to it? Well, in this context, I think I would have to accept it means provision of the security, which the other party could actually then rely upon. So that would be a signed document. And so if, if they say, well, even if you send us the signed document, we, are, if we won't accept it, that's the repudiation. That's the repudiation of this paper breach, that's, that's the analysis. Yes, my Lord. So the, the word provide, in fact, is, is the provision of a signed document. Well, I, I think that's right, because the consequences then flow that each party is secured, and each party then ought not to be taking further steps in yeah. other jurisdictions. Because the, the LOU does not require a signature by the recipient. Of it. Well, no, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, an LOU could, could be, I, I suppose, made, made orally. Um, or a draft provided in... Yeah, the, 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 the standard form that is it's envisaged that will be used of course. is a unilateral document. My Lord, yes. Yes, it doesn't require signature by both sides, certainly no. So that's, that's your Lordship's point. So, so my Lord, that, that, that's, as I say, um, the primary position we, we adopt, and a short answer if obviously we're correct. I, I was then going to mention, apropos of the question of practice, the point my learned friend raises in paragraph... 13 of his skeletons at page 45, just to touch upon this. My learned friend says that, th that this uh, argument is wrong in principle, and he says it does not reflect the practice in the market, which is the form, sorry, it's with the terms of security to be negotiated with the assistance of legal advice and consultation of the club's members. And he makes a reference to uh, the expert. Mr. Leisner, who gave evidence on our behalf. Now, so, so um, position's clear, my lords. We, we don't accept uh, that there is some form of practice uh, that is relevant in this context. As a matter of courtesy, the clubs do provide drafts, as I've, I've indicated. Uh, and we would uh, ask your lordships to approach the selective quotation of the evidence uh, with some caution. It's, it's inconsistent. Uh, first of all, it wasn't a matter that was raised at the trial for, for proper consideration, but it's also inconsistent with the respondent's pleaded case, um, which, in other words, I can briefly show you. That was to the effect that there was an expectation that security would be in the form of the ASG1. So it's inconsistent with some alleged practice of this toing and froing. And, and your lordships will see that at page 204 of the supplementary bundle. 205, I apologise. Uh, 
Uh, and you also will see just at subparagraph five, uh, there's a reference to the practice underlying the CJA on the previous page. Thus, the expectation of party to a collision jurisdiction agreement in the form of ASG 2 would be that security provided pursuant to paragraph C would be in the form of ASG 1. So, it's, as I said, it's just a, a, a warning shot from a friend that he can't now say there's some practice that's relevant of negotiating these things when he's pleaded cases that you would expect it to be in ASG 1. Well, even with ASG 1, you've got to have some to in the frame. For example, um, you've got to decide what the quantum of the security is going to be. So you can't simply um, produce it unilaterally without some kind of dialogue first. My, my Lord, exactly, exactly. So, so we submit that that is that's no no answer to, to the point. Um, my, my Lord, I mean, in a sense, what's also hidden in C is the point my Lord has just raised, that it, it talks about providing security in respect of the other's claim in a form reasonably satisfactory, but presumably it must be in an amount which is security for the claim. My, my Lord, yes. I think, I think that... That, that, whether that is encapsulated in the term form, I would submit it probably is. I imagine the practical reality. This is a, this is a practical commercial document. Although, although it's part of the ASG Group's standard form, this is a practical commercial document. And certainly, I think we would all accept that uh, 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 an offer of security in one dollar for a claim of ten million is not satisfactory in form. Form doesn't doesn't need to be simply restricted to the words. Well, um, it could be we, you know, we've made a payment into court. That's the form of security we're offering. Well, and indeed the point arises in a wider context where my little friend says, well, the judge put too much weight on the characteristics of the offer raw rather than the words of it. And we do submit that a well, the form of security here is an LOU provided by a PNI club who's a member of the IG group. That is the form of the security. Yes, except the judge was relying on the identity of the security provided at a slightly different point, namely to say that reasonable endeavours were the same as best endeavours. But uh, I entirely take your point that the form of the security also includes who is giving it, whether it's a bank or a PI club or Indeed. So, so maybe this point we'll come back to in, in the context of the respondent's notice in particular. Well, the other alternative way we put it in terms of construction, uh, if, you, if you're not with us on the primary case, uh, we, we do submit that, that, that on the true construction of, of, of the clause, there was an obligation to accept security offered when it was in a form reasonably acceptable to the recipient. And well, we, we submit that is clear from the language are used in uh, the CJA. Now, in our submission, when, when one analyzes the words that are used, for, first of all, um, we, we submit the word provide is important because it bears the construction for which we contend. There's an obligation to accept reasonably satisfactory security when offered. I mean, it, it, it bears uh, making an obvious point the wording doesn't require the parties to offer or offer for consideration security, uh, but to provide it. And that's a distinction my little friend draws in the context of my first argument, which we've just seen. He says, well, you only offered security, you didn't provide it. So if that's a valid distinction, then it's relevant to the construction of the words used and what one draws from them. The obligation uh, is to provide security. And on this analysis, the, the offer actually can't fulfill its obligation to provide it unless there's a corresponding duty to accept it. So we submit that the word uh, provide is important. It clearly conveys the party's intention that when security is offered in the acceptable form, it will be accepted. Well, the, the second point we make is that the words provide need to be read uh, with the words that follow in a form reasonably satisfactory to the other. And construing the words of the clause, it's pertinent we submit to ask, if the deal was not that the party offered would accept it, what's the point of the words reasonably satisfactory to the other? They would be perfectly pointless if there was uh, no obligation to accept. And indeed, we submit there's no reason for the party to have defined what one party is required to offer if the intention wasn't 
there to be a corresponding duty to accept it if it was in that form. Um, and indeed, if one then uh, focuses even more narrowly on the word reasonably, which imposes the judge found an objective test, we submit that's irreconcilable with the absence of an obligation to accept. If um, the parties had wished to give the receiving party a free hand, they would in our submission either have said nothing about security, or they would simply have agreed that security satisfactory to that other party be provided. That would leave the decision with that party as to whether it considered the security to be satisfactory. But here they've deliberately used uh, uh, or Im imported an objective test that the security provided must be reasonably satisfactory. Uh, and in our submission, that is uh, uh, another strong indicator of the, the yin and the yang, the obligation to offer it and the corresponding duty to accept it. Because without that obligation to accept, those words would be uh, OTOs uh, and actually have no purpose at all. So, my lords, we, we, we do submit, when one looks at, uh, at the wording, it, it's clear what the parties intended, and we submit it is also telling that the respondents fail to address any of these points in, in their skeleton argument. They don't provide an explanation of why the parties would have used this terminology if they submit there was no obligation to accept. It would be a perfectly pointless thing to have done. Uh, nor, uh, in our case, sorry, in our submission, c can the respondents give a satisfactory explanation for what I describe as the, the asymmetry of this clause on their analysis. They, they say on the one hand that it would actually be a breach not to provide security and your lordships will see that at page it's paragraph 27.4 my learned friend's skeleton at page 54 they positively state that it would itself be a breach sounding in damages for a party to fail to provide security bit hard to see what the damages would be. They would simply be the liability under the um, for the collision. Alternative, I suppose, my lord, if you incurred further costs in obtaining security elsewhere, I could see that being a potential uh, additional head of loss. But uh, your lordship's your lordship's your lordship's right. But I think I think it would it would involve potentially other claims caused by the need to go and find security, obtain security elsewhere. But the, the, the rather more uh, prosaic point I make is that you have here uh, a positive obligation on one party, so it said to provide security, uh, and an asymmetry where there's no obligation once it's offered to accept it. And uh, with respect, that there's absolutely no logic, commercial or otherwise, as to why the parties would have adopted that position in the context of this uh, agreement, which is, my lord, as indicated, is, is to the benefit of both parties. Uh, and again, my lord, we submit that's a, a good indication of why the parties clearly intended there to be an acceptance of reasonably satisfactory security. Well, as that's the, the language, then uh, at the risk of repetition, we do uh, obviously rely on the points already made about the purpose of the CJA and how that would be defeated by the answer which his lordship gave and for which my learned friend uh, contends. We submit that's another powerful indication of, of why, uh, uh, on true construction, that obligation to accept is there. And, my lords, of course, this is a, it's an agreement entered into after the event, uh, so to speak, specifically to ensure the orderly and cost-effective resolution of disputes between the parties. So principal question of uh, obviously liability, uh, law and jurisdiction is agreed again to avoid the potential difficulties of somebody trying to grab jurisdiction somewhere else and everything that, that entails and also to avoid the attempts to arrest and counter arrest and all the costs and disruption that would ensue and of course as a point I've already made the judge's response uh, only uh, deals with half of that, only achieves half of that uh, wider uh, objective. And indeed, we, we do submit that actually our construction is the only one that is consistent with the purpose 
of the CJJ, sorry, the CJA, uh, as well as its language, we submit the, the, the contrary proposition doesn't and is inconsistent with uh, uh, with that purpose. But what, what my learned friend submits in response is paragraph 27.2 of his Skelison argument at page 54, where he suggests that the significance of the CJA's function in avoiding costs is capable of exaggeration. Um, my respectful submission, that's neither accurate nor, nor is it actually an answer. Um, it, it is uh, certainly a key purpose of the CJA as I've submitted, and how, in light of the examples I've given your Lordship, that might be capable of exaggeration, I'm not entirely sure. But in any event, as I've submitted, the response unable to explain how its construction is consistent with that part of the purpose. So downplaying its significance doesn't, in our submission, uh, in any event, help. Well, th those, those are, are, are uh, points that we submit point firmly in favour of the construction for which we contend. There's one additional point, and we do submit that the respondents so just, just, pause, just pausing there, I mean, your, your point really is that the only point of providing security is to avoid arrest. Correct. That's why, that's why there is security, because if there wasn't security, there'd be an arrest, or there could be an arrest. Well, yes. It, it, it's, very, it's very shortly put, my lord, if I say so. Um, and that's right, and that's the purpose, as I've said, of, of, of the CJA, amongst other things, and the orderly resolution of this dispute. And, and without it, only half the job is done. <coughs> and it's your, I mean, your first point is just if the um, one party has the ability simply to, to say no, it's not interested, what's the point of foreseeing there at all? You it, might as well have just left it out because then somebody could provide it security um, voluntarily, offer it, and the process would take place which may or may not result in acceptance of the security which may or may not leave the other party uh, with the possibility of seeking to arrest the ship. Indeed. So the fact it's there carries with it a whole load of implications which the judge, you say, failed to spot. My lord, yes. Your lordship has summarised it very, very, very neatly, if I may say so. Those, those points, all, sorry, all, all those points indicate that, the, that there was an intention for the security to be accepted if it was offered in the requisite form. Well, it's just deal brief against a background of admiralty law that if you've got security, then you can't arrest without good cause. Well, oh, yes. One additional point which, which I make, and it, 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 it I suppose, simply reinforces what I've already said, and that, and that is we do submit that the respondent's case is, is incompatible with the principle enunciated in the case called the Kalang. Um, I, I'm going to try and address this briefly, but wish to make it clear that uh, it's just one of a number of factors that we say point the same way, and our position is no weaker without it. Uh, the respondents, I think, try to set it up as a, as a major plank of our argument. It, it, it is something we rely upon, but doesn't detract from the points I've already made to your to your lordship. Now, in, in this context, my lord and my lords, uh, we can perhaps usually start at paragraph 104 of his lordship's judgment uh, on page 197. The judge uh, found, for the reasons you'll be aware, uh, that uh, the implied. There was no obligation to be implied. Which, which paragraph? It's 104. 104. Yeah. I conclude that it's not to be implied in clause C of the CJA an obligation to accept security, which has been tended in a reasonably satisfactory form for the same reason. The alternative implied term, an obligation not unreasonably to reject security, also cannot be implied. Uh, so his lordship is, I think, drawing the logical conclusion um, that... Uh, if he's not going to imply a term, he can't even imply an obligation not unreasonably to reject. 
Uh, and that, which is the logic of his argument, we submit is inconsistent with the Kalang in that the consequence of the judge's conclusion is the recipient is entitled to exactly that which the Kalang says he cannot do, which is to use foreign proceedings uh, to obtain something more or beyond reasonable security. We say the two principles, the judge's approach clashes, butts up against that principle. And if, uh, if to do so, i.e. to look to obtain more than reasonable security in foreign proceedings is a breach of the choice of law clause, arbitration clause, then the rest of the document should be construed in that context. And look, the Kalang is at tab three of the authorities bundle. Well, very briefly, it in, uh, involved a claim for damage to bagged rice delivered uh, to Senegal under a bit of lading. A guarantee was demanded in Senegal by receivers and refused. There was an offer of an LOU with a London arbitration clause. That again wasn't accepted. There was then an application for arrest in Senegal, uh, failing payment of a sum of money, and the vessel was arrested, following which an LOU was again offered. Claim was brought for alleged breach of the arbitration clause and, and or an implied term that the party wouldn't conduct itself so as to frustrate the arbitration clause. And the claim was made including one for losses whilst under arrest. Now, my lord, the judge in that case held, and we can pick it up in, in the head note, in particular at subparagraph two. In subparagraph one, he, he held that the arbitration clause was incorporated into the relevant bill of lading. And then at uh, paragraph two, he says, an English court would not restrain a party to an English arbitration clause from arresting a vessel in another jurisdiction when the sole, sorry, where the sole purpose of the arrest was to obtain reasonable security for the claim to be arbitrated or litigated, where, however, the claims action went beyond simply seeking reasonable security. There was a breach <coughs> of the arbitration clause. So, my lords, we can pick that up in the judgment at uh, page 39, paragraph 77. <coughs> this is uh, under the heading of a section that starts on 38, the, the Brussels Arrest Convention of 1952. But at paragraph 77, his lordship cites Mr. Justice Coleman in Petromin and Seknav. And he then quotes passage from the judgment uh, in that case, about six lines up we can see a passage that starts Mr Justice Coleman saying, wherever however the sole purpose of the commencement of the proceedings in a foreign court is to accomplish the arrest of a vessel in order to provide security in respect to the claim which by reason of exclusive jurisdiction clause must be brought in a particular court or by reason of arbitration clause must be referred to arbitration. It's long been the practice, certainly in Admiralty Court, an injunction against foreign proceedings or a stay Things only to be granted on terms that alternative security is provided by the party applying for such an injunction. And that, that's, uh, we submit a, a relevant uh, caveat there. The judge then, having referred to that case and some others, at the bottom of that same column, the last paragraph is it follows in the present case, were it not for the fact the counterclaim had been stayed. Attempts by the defendants to arrest the plaintiff's vessel in foreign jurisdiction solely to obtain security for the counterclaim would not generally be restrained by injunction unless the plaintiff tendered security in lieu of arrest. Uh, but he adds that if the proceedings in foreign jurisdiction are not confined to obtaining security, um, then that would normally be restrained. And it's on that basis Lordship then uh, states his conclusions at paragraph 79, which is the passage we cite in our, in our, uh, in our skeleton. But what um, my submission is plain from that is that where reasonable security is on offer, the court is saying uh, an injunction would lie. So in this case, where security, reasonable security is on offer, the court's decided that as the premise. The 
Kalang says actually that having been offered, uh, an injunction would actually lie against attempts to get uh, security in a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, and, and we do submit in addition that where by definition reasonable security is on offer, any attempts by the respondent to use a foreign arrest must be to obtain something beyond that, which is inconsistent or clashes with the second part of the principle as um, identified in that case. Well, we, no. well, just just transpose that to our facts. What Mr. Hurst held was that arresting a ship in order to do more than simply get reasonable security was a breach of the arbitration agreement. That is well, to say, the agreement that the dispute should be resolved by London arbitration. So if we transpose that to our case, do you say that the arrest is a breach of the agreement to submit disputes to the jurisdiction of the English courts? How, how do you put, how do you well, no, we, bridge the gap? Our well, like, well, 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 submission is, is, is twofold. First is, as, as your Lordship was seeing, that the, the, the judge makes the point that even where uh, security is sought, an injunction will lie if there's been an offer or if other reasonable security is provided, number one. So we submit that plainly would, would, would be a direct analogy to our situation. Uh, but also, the second part is, uh, and what, what he says there is, it, even if, on this hypothesis, no alternative security is offered, it's still a breach of the arbitration clause if you're seeking to do more than obtain reasonable security. And in this case, they found that, uh, I think, uh, AXA had been trying to get the claim brought before Senate, so, so it's definitely an ulterior motive. But we say both apply here. Well, that allows, it doesn't quite work, does it? Because the breach, it's a breach of the arbitration clause or the exclusive jurisdiction clause because the object of the proceedings in Senegal was to get the merits disputed, uh, determined. Well, and clearly getting the merits determined when you've agreed in Senegal, when you've agreed that they'll be determined in London, is, is, a, breach. is a breach of that clause. So you can't simply read that completely onto our facts because there was no question here of the respondent seeking to get the merits of the collision claim determined in South Africa. They were only ever arresting for security. My, my lord, I, I, I accept that. Although the, the 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 wrinkle in that, my lord, is where you've been offered reasonable security in this jurisdiction. What one, one asked rhetorically, why would you be seeking security in the other jurisdiction? Because you want to get something more than reasonable security, something more favourable than what you've actually been offered. So you'd apply the Kalang by a kind of analogy rather than. Well, as, as we say, just a further point which we submit does uh, support the conclusion which we contend. My Lord, then, if I might turn to implied terms, obviously, you're not with us on the point of construction uh, in the first instance, then we, we do submit that the term is to be implied to the same effect. Party offered security uh, would accept it with, within a reasonable time. We, we, we accept that is a, an addition that can be made. Uh, and we submit that in this case, uh, it plainly uh, should be implied, both to give business efficacy to the contract and because it's so obvious it goes without saying. So we do rely on both of those alternatives to the extent that they uh, that it makes any any difference. Well, in terms of, of, of the law, uh, again, I don't believe there's any dispute between us, uh, and I'm sure your lordships would be surprised if I said there, there was, uh, as to the principle to be applied. His, his lordship cited well-known passage in Marx and Spencer's, uh, and we certainly don't um, seek, to, seek to challenge that. Uh, as always, the difference between us is as to the result which should pertain when applied to the facts of the case. My Lord, in this uh, context, I, I wanted to just start with the judge's observations uh, on this. Pa paragraph 91 of the judgment, at page 194 of the bundle. And he, he started by observing the implication of the suggested obligation would ensure that the delay 
uncertainty in costs of an arrest would be avoided. In that sense, the implied term might well be said to be necessary. That is an attractive argument. Now, just pausing there, we'll come to why he, uh, he didn't find the term to be implied. But in our submission, it is a useful starting point because it's a recognition without such a term as already submitted. The very objective, or at least part of the objective, of the CJA is uh, not achieved. And at the risk of repetition, uh, we submit you only have half a contract or half of the objective fulfilled without the term being implied. And as such, in our submission, my lords, the uh, construction for which my lord Frank contends does lack commercial and practical coherence um, uh, without the implied term that. Uh, part of the equation simply doesn't make sense. So in and of itself, in our submission, that is sufficient to justify the implication of the term. But we, we, we do also submit that it, so obviously it goes without saying that test is fulfilled. I mean, at the time of contracting, uh, and against the background we've discussed, if you ask the parties whether the recipient uh, would uh, be obliged to accept security that was reasonably satisfactory, the answer Surely, my lord, would be of course. Indeed, they might ask rhetorically, why else are we agreeing to provide it? It comes back to the point I think my lord made about what's the purpose of clause C in the first place. Um, so it translates in, in this context. Or if one could test it in this alternative way, if those, those parties were asked, do you intend that the recipient can unreasonably reject that security, which is the point I've showed you in, in his lordship's judgment, that they would say, well, of course not. If you put it in that, if you put the test, if you like, or the expression in, in different form. In, indeed, the notion... Again, it's the question, you know, though you put the implied term in terms of obligation to accept, um, is the question for the uh, bystander or the party, or whoever it is, uh, whether um, the party is entitled to arrest elsewhere if he is offered reasonable security as per the say, CJA? Well, that would be an alternative formulation. It probably question. comes to the same thing. Well, yes. Indeed, models, we, we submit the notion the party's intention was that one or other could act unreasonably and go in search of better security than uh, is on offer is, we submit, a surprising one. And my lords, in support of the same analysis, again, we submit the Kalang point uh, applies equally. And in fact, it may, may go wider than that in, in permitting the respondents uh, to act in a way that may be unreasonable. It can be said with force in our submission that that approach is, is incompatible with the, the court's wider approach over many years of implying terms in a range of circumstances such as the obligation not to take steps to defeat the purpose of a relevant agreement or where cooperation is required to take reasonable steps to achieve that objective. It's part of a wider approach the court adopts in, in these cases. Uh, and it, indeed, that, that plays back to my point about the acceptance being required to allow the offeree to provide security. You, you might say it was an implied term that the respondents will not do anything to a to avoid, sorry, to prevent my clients providing that security, but by refusing to accept it and say they're not going to abide by it, it would, in our submission, be contrary to that uh, alternative analysis. So, in our submission, my lords, and, and many of the points made in terms of construction apply here, a clear case we, we submit uh, <coughs> to imply a term if you don't see it as a matter of construction in the first instance. Now as to why the judge... I mean, uh, the, sorry, what the judge says at the end of 92 is there might be cases where a party considers it can obtain better security by arresting. So his interpretation leaves it open to the offeree to say, I want more than reasonably satisfactory security. I'm a little, uh, absolutely, but that we submit that when one looks at it, say, really? One of the points I've already made, my lord, is that the parties have, after the event, agreed to these terms. 
if if you wanted to um, have the right to go off and create havoc around the world by seeking to arrest, you don't have to agree the CJA, but 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 you have because you've agreed to a scheme which brings all the strands together and, as I've said, uh, provides for an effective um, resolution of the dispute in its entirety. So we submit that's not um, that's not a, a consistent with the the agreement the parties have reached. Well, you know, well, the judge's view was that you didn't need it if this is further up paragraph 92 because you could rely on what he calls the commercial reality that the party will generally accept it. What do you say about that? But what I say about that, my lord, is surely that uh, plays to our submission that the answer is uh, so obvious the parties needn't express it. If, if, if parties, the practical reality is parties are going to accept it, surely that only supports our position is so obvious that parties would have been expected a term to be implied if, if the position is that any reasonable recipient will say yes fine I'm accepting that thank you very much that, that in our submission only supports our position rather than detracts from it but it, I mean, you could put it another way which is if, if you're just relying upon the commercial reality that if somebody is offered something that's reasonably satisfactory that they would accept it you don't need 4C in the agreement my lord indeed Indeed. You, you just say nothing and allow commercial reality to take its course. Well, well, exactly. But if you put it into the agreement, your argument is that it's an indication on the part of the two parties who are advised by lawyers who know the regime, who know the way it operates, that something is supposed to happen, supposed to mean something. Well, exactly. Well, look, on that part of the judge's analysis, as your lordships will have seen, in paragraph 92, he he said he was guided by uh, an observation of uh, the master of the roles, um, which is quoted in uh, Marx and Spencer in, in turn. Uh, well, the point we've just been discussing is his application of that principle. My lord, yes. Now, my lord, what, what we submit isn't entirely clear is whether um, his lordship took that passage uh, as adding anything to the test otherwise uh, relevant to identifying an implied term. I have to say it's not, not entirely clear. But what I would submit to your Lordship is that when one looks at, at the passage in question, it's in, it's in tab 2. The case Phillips Electronic is in tab 2. Well, I don't think we need go to the facts particularly, but if I ask your lordships to turn to page 19 of the bundle. It starts about half halfway down. What, what, what his lordship um, was discussing here is the question whether a term should be implied, and if so, almost inevitably arises after a crisis has been reached in the performance of the contract. He then refers to Lord Justice Scrutton in Reigate and Union Manufacturing. And as your Lordships will see in that passage, uh, Lord Justice Scrutton was uh, discussing the uh, what I call the obviousness test, of course, so uh, and, and so will happen. We did not trouble to say that. It's too clear. What his Lordship then, in my respectful submission, goes on to say is he... He then uh, looks at this part of uh, Scrutton Lord Justice's approach in, in the context of a, a novel and highly risky case. And he says, in familiar cases already mentioned, there could be little room for doubt what the party's joint answer would be had the question been raised at the outset. There would almost literally have been no, sorry, only one possible answer. This may not be so where a contract is novel, known to involve more than ordinary risk, and known to be more than ordinarily uncertain its outcome. And it's not enough to show had the parties foreseen the eventuality which in fact occurred, they would have wished to make provision for it, unless it can also be shown there was only one contractual solution, or that one of several possible solutions would without doubt have been preferred. The reference to Trollope, Trollope and Cole is of some significance, because a point in Trollope and Cole's was that there were no, I think there were five alternative implied terms, five alternative formulations of the implied term. Um, for which whoever it was was contending, and the House of Lords said, well, you've got this choice, this, uh, Mr Justice Morgan once called an a la carte menu in 
applied terms, and that, that's not just not how they work. So when Sir Thomas Bingham was speaking of several contractual solutions, he wasn't, one might think, saying, well, either there's a contractual solution or no contractual solution. He's saying, well, there are lots of different ways you can formulate this implied term. And that's the problem. My lord, and that's the point I was going to submit to your lordship. First of all, his lordship was plainly not uh, super adding any other requirement. He, he was dealing within the context of the it's so obvious test mm. uh, and applying it to a, a novel situation where there was a high risk uh, to those involved. Uh, and as your lordship quite correctly pointed out, if I may say so, he's not saying when you either, you know, the two, the two solutions are either a contractual or just nothing. It seems to me that he was addressing a different point where that term could be formulated in different ways. Yeah, well, that's, that's the significance of his cross reference to Trollope and Coles. My Lord. So, so, my Lord, we do submit that, and as I said, it is unclear whether his Lordship felt that was super adding a requirement to the test or not. But in our respectful submission, when, when one then looks at it and, and looks at the two options that he identifies, um, which are set out in paragraph 92, one solution is to imply the suggested term, the other solution is not to imply the suggested term but leave to commercial reality. Your Lordship's point is, 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 is uh, valid there. But, but also when one looks at the objective that is to be achieved, which is to avoid the cost, delay, etc., of arrest, in our submission that second option wouldn't achieve that result because it allows for an unreasonable, unprincipled reaction that defeats the very object of uh, the provision. So, so we do submit that, however one analyses it, the only contractual solution to achieve the party's objective is to imply uh, a term, and the, the term to be implied is, is straightforward and obvious in our submission. So we, we, we submit that is that's where the judge, with respect, uh, went uh, wrong. So my lords, th th those are our submissions on uh, the alternative case implied term. Well, the three points made by my learned friend in his respondent's notice. If it's convenient, I might address those briefly now. Your Lordship will find the respondent's notice at page 35 of the core bundle. It's page 35 of the core bundle. It's tab three, my lord. And what Mr. Uh, Turner says uh, here in paragraph one uh, is that there are three reasons why the judge was correct uh, not to imply a term. So, so as I understand it, these points simply go to the implication of the terms and not relevant to the point of construction. Now, the first is that any term uh, would need to be drafted to allow time for it to be considered. Well, my lords, the answer to that is straightforward. Within a reasonable time uh, is, is a well-known part of many um, uh, implied terms, and it really shouldn't stand in the way of an implication of lordships otherwise consider appropriate. And indeed, in our skeleton, we reference the judge during the course of discussion, uh, making that very point. So th that first objection we, we submit is one of no substance. The second argument is that any implied term, it is said, would have to allow for an attempt to negotiate not to be deemed to be a rejection of the security offered. Now, obviously, I'll, I'll hear my own friend on this, but the point appears to be that if the respondent came back with some amendments to the draft, and subsequently accepted the original draft was OK, it would somehow lose the right to have security. It's a sort of offer and acceptance analysis, saying, here's my offer, I counter-offer, therefore, you know, the offer originally made lapses. But that, that, that in uh, our submission, is to confuse two different situations. First is the offer and acceptance situation, and the second is the situation we have here, which is where the parties are perhaps negotiating as to what the terms 
uh, sorry, as to the terms which the offer is contractually obliged to provide. The, the, the ding dong in our case would be, here's my LOU, I say that is reasonably satisfactory on an objective basis. The respondent comes back and says, no it isn't, we need the addition of this or the deletion of that. If the respondent then, after consideration, said, well, actually, we accept that your initial offer is reasonably satisfactory. They don't lose the right to have it in that form. We're contractually obliged to provide it. And so this uh, point, if it is, as I understand it, it is, as I said, to confuse the offer and acceptance analysis uh, with negotiation of, of terms. So again, it doesn't uh, cause any difficulty in implying a, a term. And the debate we had below was that what might be a reasonable time for accepting would encompass and allow some latitude for the respondent to have this debate, if it was a reasonable one to have. They might say, well, we think this is reasonable, uh, and that would be uh, built into the reasonable time allowance, um, some time for that to take place, if that's what the parties wish to do. So it's not. I mean, the reasonably satisfactory security might only emerge after negotiations. My, my lord, exactly, exactly. Um, but the, the uh, point. But without the implied term, despite having participated in negotiations and agreeing satisfactory, agreeing a satisfactory form of security, without the implied term, the offeree can still say, "Well, I'm, we've had that negotiation about the form. Yes, it's reasonably satisfactory." Indeed. It's an odd outcome. So that's the, the, the second point. The, the third point that's raised is that it's said that the implied term, and, and all of these are said to create difficulties in implying a sufficiently clear or well-defined term. The, the third is that it should allow for the rejection of an offer of security that was unacceptable for reasons unconnected with its form. Now the example which my learned friend gives, and the only example he gives in his skeleton is at paragraph 21.1 on page 50. Uh, and he cites an example where the securing party is insolvent or itself subject or vulnerable to sanctions. Uh, and that mirrored an argument before the judge which he rejected. But in our submission, it appears to be predicated on un. Uh, duly narrow um, but presently undefined meaning which the respondent seeks to give to the word form. I think the debate we've already had. Certainly in our submission to take that example the form of the guaranteed offered in this case can properly be said to be a letter of undertaking issued by a P&I club which is a member of the international group. That is the form of the security that is offered. The same way you might say the form of the guarantee is a it is a guarantee from a first-class European bank or something of that ilk. So we don't accept that one can properly narrow down the term form to exclude those sorts of issues. That's in our submission consistent with the language and the practical reality. So again, we submit the characteristics of the offer or are plainly part and parcel of the form of security and relevant to the question, of course, of whether it's in the form that is reasonably satisfactory to the respondent. So in our submission, my lords, the, the additional grounds in the respondent's notice for uh, seeking to reject an implied term don't uh, add up to, to anything, and no reason, if you're otherwise with us, uh, not to imply that term. Uh, and my lords, just to conclude, for, for the reasons we've given, we submit the judge was wrong in the conclusion he reached and the finding he made on that first issue that uh, there was no breach and the rejection of the LOU was one that the, the respondents were entitled to make. Um, it follows, my lord, if you're with us on that, uh, that the judge should have found, and this is actually technically ground two of uh, our grounds of appeal, but it's contingent on ground one. If, if, if you're with us, then his lordship should have found, and surely would have found, that the respondent did indeed act in breach of the CJA uh, and should have made an award of damages in my client's favour. So, so, my lord, that is, uh, those are our submissions on our appeal. As I indicated, your lordship, I... Just to go back to Trollope and Coles for a moment. Uh, if you go to the supplementary authorities bundle at tab 16, page 437, uh, you will find a certain textbook 
summarises Torah and Coles and quotes from Lord Cross. And that's the point, I think, that the Master of the Rolls was making in the Phillips Electronic case. There were four different, four formulations of the reply itself discussed by Lord Pearson and a fifth by Lord Cross. That, that was the point in the Torah and Coles. My Lord. My Lord, unless I can assist you any further, those who have submission on the appeal. Well, but just one factual question. Um, the collision action has happened now, and your side lost, is that right? My Lord, yes. Um, so has the UK club uh, LOU been called on? No, my Lord, because quantum is still being uh, tried. Ah, that's the answer then. OK. Thank well, you very much. No, that makes, that makes sense. Well, I'm also told that it can't be called upon until the South African proceedings are resolved. Right. OK, well, that's two reasons why I have to have OK, that's all right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. My Lord, by way of uh, supplement to the answer that I just um, gave to your uh, Lordship, uh, I'm instructed that the, it's a term of the UK Club LOU that the South African proceedings have to have run their course before it can be called on. No, that's fine. I just, it just occurred to me, why hasn't it been? But there, there's an abundance of reasons why, why it hasn't. Thank you. Um, my Lord, I want to start, if I may, uh, by taking a few minutes to sketch out the relevant law and practice underlying arrest. Uh, although it's meat and drink to the judge and to me and to my learned friend, it may be relatively unfamiliar to your lordship. Uh, and that matters because to appreciate the scope, the function, the purpose of Clause C, it's relative, relevant to have in mind what difference it makes, uh, or to put the point another way, uh, what the position would be without it. My overarching submission, so you know where this is going, will be that Clause C makes relatively little difference, although it is not pointless, as my learned friend said. Uh, and secondly, that if the parties or the ASG had intended to make intended it to make as much difference as my learned friend submits, they would have made that clear. But they did not. So I'm going to start with arrest. The arrest of ships is available for certain maritime claims. There's a list of them set out in off the top of my head, section 20 of the Senior Courts Act. Uh, you don't need to detail, but the classes of claim include collision. The classes of claim do not include a claim for failure to put up security. As the judge spelled out in the first sentence of his judgment uh, on page 176. An arrest is means, he said, of establishing jurisdiction and obtaining security. Well, a a actually, that's not quite right, because in most cases, it is the service of the claim form that establishes jurisdiction. Uh, but we're not concerned with that detail, uh, although if your lordships were to require authority on it, um, you can find it in the Court of Appeal judgment in the Alcyon, which is in the authorities bundle tab 11, page 316, at paragraph 82, little Roman 2. In the Paradigm case, uh, and I'm going to ignore for now complications about the identity of the party liable in persona and, and the like, um, a, an action in REM can be brought against the ship in connection with which the cause of action arose. And for ease of cross-reference, I'll just call that the original ship. Uh, and the original ship can, in those in-rem proceedings, be arrested. You can only bring an in-rem claim against a ship and arrest it if it is in the jurisdiction. in terms of the same paragraph in the Alcyon, but nonetheless is, is controversial. 
Arresting a ship is, in effect, a means of prejudgment enforcement, as it usually produces some form of security. And if it does not, the ship can be sold with clean title and the proceeds paid into court. Now, almost all commercial ships are nowadays owned by single shipping companies, so one ship per company. One, perhaps the reason for that, is the availability of so-called sister ship arrest. Broadly speaking, this allows a vessel in the same ownership as the original ship to be proceeded against in an in rem action and arrested. Same ultimate ownership. No, the same actual. If, 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 if. But you just so started by saying it's one ship per company. That's right, and that's why. And one of the reasons for that is sister ship arrest. Right, I follow. So, sister ship arrest allows you to arrest a ship in the same ownership. Right. For the claim arising in respect of the first ship, the original ship. Yeah. It works on the assumption that each company is the owner legally and beneficially of the ship which is registered in its name. Uh, it, it does make that assumption, my lord. Um, there's some quite tricky law on this. Um, I'd um, be happy to indulge your no, lordship, no, but I it's. Uh, <laughs> it's just the theory is. Yes. One ship legally and beneficially owned by yeah, is. one company, therefore you can't have sister ship arrest. That's the theory. Um, that that is the theory. I mean, it, it, yeah. that is right. I mean, it, in in practical terms, as I come to to say, sister ship arrest happens very rarely. The Shipping Corporation of India used to have all its ships owned by the Shipping Corporation of India, which was wonderful because there were hundreds of them. They were always everywhere, and you could always find one to arrest. Um, I haven't seen that for a few years, so perhaps... I think my Lord's that. point to you, if I got it right, was that if you have um, Greek tycoon, let's choose a nationality, but let's choose Greek, just for the sake of saying it's involved in shipping, who owns two companies, Company A and Company B, Company A owns ship A, Company B owns ship B. Um, no sister ship arrest. No, that's the that's the idea. No sister ship arrest, even though the ultimate owner of the companies that is, right. is common. That is right. Um, but in addition to sister ship arrest, there is also the beast of associated ship arrest. Uh, this is, as far as I know, uh, only available in South Africa. May possibly be available in Namibia as well, but makes the same point. It allows arrest of a ship that is in that is in common control uh, rather than common ownership with the original ship. Now, in terms of enforcing a claim against a ship owner that doesn't want to pay it, arrest is in practice the only game in town. Uh, and that is for three reasons. The first is that the principal and usually only identifiable asset of the owning company is the ship. The second is that post-judgment enforcement against ships is all but unheard of in practice. There's a host of reasons for that, but uh, I needn't get into that unless you would like me to. Um, but one of them is that post-judgment arrest uh, is not possible in many jurisdictions. Um, notwithstanding the wording of the White Book, quite probably including this one. Um, but it, it's not a universal position. And there are some reasons for that wrapped up in the theory behind um, uh, in -rem, the nature of in rem proceedings. And again, I need it sort of almost stands the normal civil claims on their head, doesn't it? Because normally you can't get security for a claim you're bringing against the defendant unless you can show, in fact, you, you, you can't get security. What you can get is probably a freezing injunction, which is a way of preventing them from improperly disposing of assets so as to frustrate a judgment. But you have to normally wait, otherwise, to get your judgment.
judgment which you then seek to execute. Right. You're saying that that never happens, or very rarely happens in the shipping world, and that the standard form is that everybody goes for a form of pre-judgment security. Exactly. And, uh, there are many reasons for that. One reason is that there may be an interval of some years between the uh, original incident and the, um, the outcome of the case. That's the by way with most civil claims. Well, it is. But by which time, ships are a wasting asset, by which time the ship may have been sold to another company. And take my learned friend's client's ship, in this case, was sold off the top of my head 18 months, two years ago. So it, it, in terms of enforcing a judgment against my learned friend's client, that's no longer possible because the, the ship is gone. So all that is left. Unless you have a maritime security. lien. Well, which you don't for damage claims. Well, you no, know, you do have a maritime lien for damages claims. Yes. yes. So, which is why I was careful to say against my loan friend's client. For 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 there is a collision lien. So there is a, a there is the possibility, yes, of proceeding in rem against the ship itself, although not after judgment. That's that's the trouble, because after judgment, um, the the lien. Evaporates, but I'm getting into complications that really you're looking. It may be that it all stems from the, the one ship, one one company only one ship structure that is frequently adopted. It, it's what it actually stems from, that my lord, is that the, the the way before the Judicature Act that the Admiralty Court started an action um, against a ship was to arrest it in order to provide jurisdiction, as which. Now the Alkian says isn't actually necessary. It, 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 exactly so, and, and of course in those days, if you wanted to enforce a debt, you, you threw the debtor in prison. So it's not that that different. Um, but the, the the commencement of the action was um, the arrest of the ship, and the arrest was then maintained because that was the court's jurisdiction, unless and until security was put up or it was sold because ships are wasting asset and you don't want them. Uh, hanging around it. So now, in England and similar jurisdictions. Um, oh, sorry, I went to the third reason. You said there were three reasons. The, the, well, the, the the post judgment arrest is not possible in many jurisdictions. Yeah. Is, is really the third reason, which actually was really illuminating. This, this oh, I see. Yeah, I mean not legally possible, um, or, not, ju or just ineffective. No, not not legally possible. Because the um, because of the nature of the in rem claim, the the, the, the fiction is that um, an in rem claim is itself the enforcement of the lien on the ship. So the lien subsists uh, and, until you get judgment, and then it's not there anymore. Um, so that's. That, that's why it's, it's legally not possible. That's, in this there's a, the jury is out as to whether that is still the case in this jurisdiction because part 61 appears to suggest that you can have a post-judgment arrest. Um, but whether that really means quite what everyone thinks it means is something that I may entertain your lordships with one day in the future. Um, so, the, the final thing to note before I get on to wrongful arrest is that in England, uh, well, it's related to wrongful in England and similar jurisdictions, so I mean Canada, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and so on, um, where the claim is in the statutory list, arrest is available as of right without the need to give or secure um, a, a cross undertaking in damages. In that sense, it's very much unlike a, a freezing order. Uh, and that's the Alkian at paragraph 43. Uh, and that, of course, makes arrest an attractive remedy. But what if the arrest turns out to be wrongful? In English law... Well, it, makes, it makes arrest an attractive remedy for a claim. Yes. Not very attractive for defendants. Well, um, yes and no, my lord. I mean, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the, there is a whole ecosystem which has evolved around what I've been describing. Uh, and the ecosystem is effectively the PNI claims and hull underwriters, uh, an insurance market which is extremely well practiced 
in putting up uh, security, uh, where there's even a sniff of an arrest. But this is because when you have a collision, unless it's blindingly obvious to everybody who's at fault, and there's liability, and maybe that's just never the case. Well, it was, um, it was blindingly obvious to some of us in this case, my lord, but it took Mr. Anyway, Justice Tears trial for the day. Um, th there's always the possibility that there will be arrest in both directions. Yes. Okay. And therefore, as I understand Mr. Nigel Tears' introduction, everybody thinks, well, rather than that game, let's try and sort the provision of security out rather than having arrests flying in both directions. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, but, and if, if your lordships um, browse the outcome, um, First instance and in the Court of Appeal, there's quite a lot of discussion uh, as to the extent to which um, arrest is ever used. And arrest features in, in something under 10% of in rem actions. Uh, it, and where it features most often, uh, I venture, uh, is where it's brought to enforce a, a mortgage on the ship. Uh, and in that instance, of course, the insurance company is not going to put up security. Um, that that's not covered in an insurance policy, um, but the insurer, the insurers, and the PNI clubs will put up um, the LOUs and other forms of security in cases like collision, uh, but also damaged cargo uh, uh, and so on, uh, bunker disputes occasionally. But the, so there's a, a very um, good, uh, smooth running system, which prevents it actually interfering with the ship and its commercial operations in, in, in most cases. And actually that's preferable to the ship owner because the alternative would be someone chasing around, um, provided he still owns the ship, uh, and taking it and, and selling it under a written endorsement many years later. And that's, that's really disruptive. So uh, uh, the system is, um, is a good one. Now, as I say, models, what if the arrest turns out to be wrongful? Uh, in English law, damages can be recovered, but only if, as uh, Mr. Thomas has said, if the arrest is made um, with malice or gross negligence. Uh, and that's the, the Alkian at paragraph 44. And perhaps we could turn that up. Um, it's on page 306 of the <coughs> authorities bundle. Uh, but the, the issue in the Alcuin was where a mortgagee arrests ship, um, must the arresting party put up, or can it be asked to put up um, security um, for the wrongful arrest claim? Um, held, there's no binding rule on that, but the, the invariable practice is uh, no, unless there are. Um, Quite seriously extenuating circumstances. So, in, at the bottom of 306, um, this is in the, the, the Court of Appeals judgment, um, to confirm the point I made a, a short while earlier uh, that provided the property is um, within the scope of an action in REM and has been procedural compliance with the rules, arrest is as of right, no judicial, judicial discretion is involved. Sorry, where are you? I thought we were going to 306. Is that, we? Is that um, where we are? I'm on 306 of the bundle, my lord. Yeah. Paragraph 44. 44, yes. Uh, well, I was in paragraph 43. I was just reading 43, and then I was going to 44. Yeah. So no judicial discretion is involved. No question arises at the cross undertaking damages um, as the price for receiving the warrant. All this is common ground. Secondly, no damages can be claimed for wrongful arrest, absent malice, bad faith, or effectively gross negligence on the part of the arresting party, TV of evangelismos, uh, and uh, some of the other cases. Now, but the, the position uh, varies strongly across different jurisdictions. And one sees that in the, in the same case if we turn on to page uh, 314. Uh, and just rather than me solemnly read this out to your lordships, can I, can I ask your lordships just to read from paragraph 70 down to um, letter H? You can, you can leave off the last five lines of the page.
and in fact, you can see over the page, I've, I've sort of just so you can resist um, uh, taking a peek. There, there is provision in the Arrest Convention 1999, which yeah. is not the law in this country, um, for uh, undertakings and damages. And there are some countries, as you've seen, that have enacted that, and there are others that haven't. But the, the short point is that your lordships will have seen that it is not right that quotes almost all jurisdictions uh, make it difficult to establish a claim of wrongful arrest, which is the point made in my learned friend Skeleton, at paragraph 41 on page 104. Indeed, uh, in fact, both South Africa and Australia now use the touchstone of negligence rather than malice and gross negligence. Uh, and you can see that um, in the extract from Berrington and Turner which is in the authority bundle at page 447. Um, like Lord Justice Lewis, and I'm not dead, but I'm going to cite this one uh, And if, if I could ask your Lordship simply to, to read to yourselves from 776 to 779. <coughs> So just drawing the threads together of, of where we've got to so far, four points. The first that is in practical terms, if you have a claim against a ship owner who is unwilling to provide security, you will face what may well be insurmountable difficulties of enforcement if you cannot arrest in a suitable jurisdiction. Secondly, you can only arrest for certain types of claim and not for others. And thirdly, you can usually only arrest the vessel in connection with which the claim arose. Sister ship is a relative rarity. Associated ship arrest is more common, but only if an associated ship calls in South Africa, which they do. It's a main trade route, and there's a bunkering, many bunkering calls there and so on. Uh, and fourthly, a, a wrongful arrest can give rise to a liability and damages, certainly uh, where it is made maliciously or with gross negligence. So with that in mind, my lords, if I may, I'm going to go on to the, the default position after a collision. So when ships have been involved in a collision, typically the owner of each will have, as Lord Justice Snowden pointed out, um, a, a claim against the other or others involved. And three problems immediately arise. Security, jurisdiction, and governing law. As 
for security in the absence of agreement between them or their representatives, the only means of obtaining security for the claims will be by making an effective arrest. And in this and similar jurisdictions, if the arrest doesn't prompt the provision of security, the ship arrested can be sold, and the proceeds are paid into court to, to abide the event. Um, and the costs of the, there is a relevance to this, the costs of the producer of the fund, typically the arresting party, have a very high priority in the distribution of the fund. That becomes second after the Admiralty Marshal. Because you may have, you may have a, you and frequently do have a fund with many claims on it, and the fund isn't sat, it's sufficient to satisfy all the claims, and so there is a priority. There. Again, I'm not concerned with that. Now, there is, of course, no obligation at any stage to provide security. In the vast majority of cases, though, arrest or the threat of it, will prompt its provision. Security can take several different forms. But the classic form, anticipated I think by my Lord Lord Justice Lewison, uh, is to give bail nowadays by paying money into court. Um, in the in times gone by, there was a, a thing called a bail bond, but that's fallen into disuse in this jurisdiction, at least. A second, bank guarantee. A third, P and I club LOUs. A fourth, Hull underwriter LOUs. There's an example of that in, in the bundle, um, and that's because under Hull insurance, um, sometimes Hull underwriters have. Take on some of the liability arising from collision. Uh, other forms are possible, but to be fair, rarely seen. They might include payment into escrow or payment into a solicitor's client account against a suitable undertaking as well. Now, when practitioners talk in this context about forms of security, this is what they have in mind the various forms in which it can be provided. Now, just as there is no obligation to provide security, so there is also no obligation to accept it. But where security is put up that is acceptable at any rate in the eyes of the court, then an application to release the vessel from arrest will inevitably succeed with costs. Uh, moreover, the initiation or the maintenance of arrest where acceptable security has been provided will risk a claim for damages for wrongful arrest. My Lord or Justice Males raised the point with my learned friend, um, or suggested to my learned friend, that where you've got acceptable security, you can't arrest. But the, the position, I mean, colloquially, that's correct, but the position in law and practice is that you can arrest as of right when you have a claim. There is, there is no discretion. You simply fill in a form which doesn't have anything about um, whether you've already got security. Uh, and then the Admiralty Marshal will issue the, the warrant and away you go. If you have a if you have a P and I club LOU in your pocket and you and you initiate arrest proceedings without telling the court, although I appreciate no judge has to look at these papers, then that would be the clearest possible case of wrongful arrest, wouldn't it? Well I would have thought so, my lord, yes. I mean I'm not, I don't want to make any concessions because uh, I guess I have to argue this one day. But but one would think so, yes. I mean that, that would be a really obvious case of wrongful arrest. But the point is that the and, way and the way of the arrest convention says that, doesn't it? Article three? Uh, your lordship may be ahead of me on that. Um, in which arrest convention? Fifty two or ninety nine? The one that's law in this country. Uh, then then it does. I think I'll check it by all means. 
But, but, but the, the, the point is that the way that it works in practice is that you have to apply, set aside the arrest. The arrest would be set aside, and no doubt indemnity costs, and quite possibly, as your lordship says, um, quite likely a claim for. Oh, that's because that's because arrest in this jurisdiction is an automatic process, and there is therefore no duty of full and frank disclosure. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the the Vasso and cases like it. Um, the the general approach. I'm thinking of arrests uh, elsewhere. The general approach taken by English law as regards what is or is not acceptable security is that it is a matter for the court in which the arrest has been made. Uh, and, and that comes out of the, the judgment in the Kalang. Um, and could we turn that up? I'm going to come back to the Kalang. But, um, Go to page 29 of the authorities bundle. If I could ask your lordships just to read two, two, one passage on this page and then another on the next. Passage on this page is paragraph 25, so starting roughly halfway down the left hand column. <coughs> so who is he before the quotations? That's Mr. Parton, is it? Uh, well, the judge of No, sorry. that's the judge. The judge of sorry. Is it Miss Justice Cook? Yes. short passage on the following page in what is paragraph 32 of this judgment, but quoting paragraph 36 of the judgment of Mrs. Justice Gloucester, which she then was, um, in the right-hand column in her paragraph 36, halfway uh, down, um, so about six lines down that paragraph, there's a little B, although ultimately it is a matter for the arresting court to decide the terms of the security. Now let's come back to the Kalang. Now, so I've dealt with security in this default world. So far as jurisdiction and governing law are concerned, in practical terms, and again, absent agreement between the parties, uncertainties regarding jurisdiction and governing law will be resolved by the service of proceedings in which the arrest is made. That's certainly true in England and Wales uh, and similar jurisdictions. Uh, it may not be true of all. I have, in fairness, yet to encounter a civilian jurisdiction that uh, adopts the pragmatic approach uh, of the common law of assuming that a foreign law is the same as one's own until the contrary is proved. Um, but we don't uh, need to be too worried about that. So just drawing these threads together, in the absence of agreement between the parties, no one is obliged to put up or accept security. But the decision not to do either of those things is not without consequence. In that, first, there may be an arrest with the arresting party recovering their costs of arrest. Secondly, a failure to lift an arrest if acceptable security is provided will result in the arrest being set aside with costs and a risk of liability for wrongful arrest. 
And thirdly, um, there will be, for as long as there's no agreement or arrest, uncertainty as to which court will take jurisdiction and what law will apply. Now, these, these are all factors that an admiralty practitioner would know and understand, and they form part of the hinterland to construing agreements like the CJA in this case. These are the legal consequences. I mean, the practical consequences, the commercial consequences of having a ship arrested are also potentially huge and highly disruptive. Yes, and that's why the insurance industry has evolved such good techniques for avoiding that happening. But it does still happen. But um, given the statistics that I've quoted to you, it's not as often as sadly once it did. So I'm going to turn now, my lords, to the CJA. Um, Just to educate me, if, if, if I get an arrest, if I arrest a ship, who pays to maintain it whilst it is arrested? Um, in the case that the owner is not prepared to pay it itself, the, um, the, the immediate answer is the Admiralty Marshal will do the, the minimum necessary to keep it um, alive and safe and so on. Uh, but so that the person may... first of the fund if it's sold. Yes. Um, and But the, the, the marshal will only get involved against an undertaking from the arresting party to um, see the Admiralty Marshal whole for the expenses that he incurred or she incurred. So, my lords, uh, the CJA is at page 126 of the core bundle. <clears throat> now, we can see, uh, looking at that at once, that it resolves the questions of jurisdiction and governing law, Clause A. Of course, that actually immediately creates another problem, which is service. We'll come back to that, but because um, that's also cured in the, uh, in, in, the, in the document. Clauses D and E clear up another potential issue, which is the, part, the identity of the party to be sued. In in-rem proceedings, the ship is named on the claim form, uh, but the party liable is only described, uh, although their name and address still have to be in the box on the bottom left-hand corner of the form. It wasn't the case with Ritz in-rem. Incidentally, but in, with the, the modern claim form, you still have to say who is this going to be served on and where, if not on the ship. Um, in now, as the identity of that party, in the case of collision, the party liable will be the ship's demise charterer, if there is one. Otherwise, it will be the ship owner. Um, now, as my Lord of Justice Mails uh, intimated the position can become more complicated still with claims in collision and salvage which give rise to maritime liens, but we don't need to uh, get into that. I said I was going to ignore uh, complications of proper party and I'm, I'm going to stick to that. But in essence, that, what, that is what clauses D and E um, are about. Ta taken together, clauses A, B, D and E allow the initiating process to be issued and served without having to wait for a ship to turn up in the jurisdiction. And it goes without saying, I hope from what I have put before your lordships, that those are all valuable steps. And 
that brings me more or less neatly to call C. Uh, and I'm going to address your logic on call C under two heads. One is um, it, its effect, and the other its effect if security is uh, the effect if security is provided. So uh, as the effect of clause C, clause C obviously is concerned with the provision of security. That's what it says. On its face, it makes a change to the position which would apply in its absence. The parties are now obliged to put up security, where before they were not. Its practical effect, though, uh, is muted. Uh, and I say that even though, as I observe in my skeleton paragraph 27.4, which is on page 54, breach of it would sound in damages and might support an application for a freezing injunction. Um, the, the only example I give there is damages in the form of unrecovered costs incurred in arrest proceedings. I can't think of anything else. Um, and I say its effect is muted because, um, I'm afraid for, I hate doing this, but for five reasons. Um, the first is that for the reasons I've given, enforcement against a ship owner is in practical terms almost invariably confined to arrest. Secondly, arrest is not available for breach of an obligation to put up security. Thirdly, the costs incurred in arrest proceedings will usually be recovered within those proceedings. The idea of chasing after unrecovered costs, although theoretically possible, is not a practical proposition, at any rate, not a cost-effective proposition. Most importantly, hopefully, its effect is muted because there is still no practical means of compelling a securing party to put up security. Fifthly, apart, that is, from arrest. An arrest, or the credible threat of an arrest, is the principle, indeed only, way of compelling a party to comply with its obligation under Clause C. And my lords, one sees that in this case. The appellant didn't make its first offer of security, and there was no uh, putting forward a draft and see what you think, until after the arrest in South Africa. See the judgment at paragraphs 24 to 27, on page 179 of the bundle. Uh, and just pausing there, I, I do ask your lordships to note that point in passing, because my learned friend may have left you with the impression that my client dashed off to wreak havoc, as he puts it, uh, elsewhere, despite the offer of an LOU. But that is not the case. Uh, indeed, my clients had pressed for uh, draft security, uh, and they had said, if it's not forthcoming, we're going to arrest. And there was no uh, response until after the arrest was made. Uh, I don't expect your lordships to decide the case on that, but I just want to correct an impression that you may have got. Nor is it the case that the arrest caused any particular delay. The vessel was arrested on the 5th, and an LOU was provided on the 10th, after the discussions between um, our respective clients' clubs had come to nothing. That's, um, the reference to that is in the chronology, which is on page 164 of the bundle. Now, one sees it also... Was there a fifth reason how we got four? You said there were only five reasons. Uh, well, I do apologise, my lord, um, if I've missed a number. I, 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 th five. I thought you said that number five, five is the rest is the only way to compel compliance with... That, that was my number five. Oh, was it? Oh, in that case, I've conflated that. It's my number four, but anyway, never mind, all right. Yeah. Um, one sees um, the importance of this um, in 
in the case of the other vessel involved in the collision, the Sakazaya Kalon, it didn't have security from the Panamax Alexander for another 15 months. That's, so you see that in the chronology at page 172. Uh, and by that time, the collision action, which was between all three vessels, was halfway between the CMC and the trial. So your lordships will see at once, and this perhaps is a, an important uh, point, and I might leave you with, um, with your permission um, before the short adjournment, that it is not just the party to be secured that can upset the smooth operation of Clause C. It is also, indeed, predominantly the securing party. Would it be right to say, another thought to leave you with, um, perhaps, that the effect of clause C and E taken together is to transfer the decision about whether security is reasonably satisfactory from the arresting court to the English court. Yes, I, I think... I, uh, and should therefore the same consequence follow, that is to say you told us that if the arresting court decides that the security... If, if the arresting court decides that security is satisfactory, the vessel should be released that if the English court decides that the security is satisfactory, then equally the vessel should be released. Uh, I was going to come on to that, my lord, but, but in my respectful submission, I, I, I want to be careful because um, what we're straying into now is effectively an anti-suit injunction scenario. That's not how the case has been put before your lordships. Uh, and I'm wary about saying, well, yes, of course, because not least because I may be arguing the contrary um, one day. But uh, one can certainly see a, a compelling argument. Um, I, I respectfully agree with your lordship. It, it plainly does transfer the, the the question of who assesses if the security is reasonably satisfactory to the English court. That's the effect of the uh, uh, of the the clauses your lordship has mentioned. And that being so, um, one is outside, it seems to me respectfully, the um, uh, the boundaries of the Kalang and the passages that I took you to earlier, uh, because the, the English court now has, as it were, skin in the game. Uh, it has a voice, uh, and it has been chosen by the parties, in effect, to decide, if they can't agree, what is uh, reasonable security. Uh, and so it is um, more than conceivable that a, a, an application for an anti-suit injunction to restrain arrest um, or the continuation of arrest where ex hypothesi reasonably satisfactory security has been put up uh, would uh, or at least could succeed. I, I respectfully agree. My Lord's um, that is very neatly one o'clock. You would like me to stop? What are we there. doing for time, uh, Mr. Taylor? Uh, we obviously have to finish this appeal today. Oh, we're going to finish today, my lord. Um, uh, um, I'll have a think. Um, but I started speaking at um, roughly quarter past twelve. Quarter past eleven. Quarter uh, past twelve. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, if we've got an even split, then that gives me another hour and a quarter. All right, two o'clock.